Made in Japan, it's, it's the essence of that kind of early 70s double live album. It was a bestseller, it was a platinum album, and the band were at full tilt. They were all playing at the best of their ability. Beautifully recorded, beautifully played, beautifully performed. It had all the tracks that you wanted to hear, and it sounded better than the originals. It was quite exotic, you know. God, they've been to Japan, you know. It's not from Huddersfield, you know. It was quite, <laughs> quite remarkable for that time, really. <laughs> The Made in Japan album was recorded by the classic purple lineup of Gillen, Glover, Blackmore, Lord, and Pace, better known to their legions of admirers as Deep Purple Mark II. If all you wanted to do was go along and see basic four, four and a half minute songs, you might as well go home because the whole point of a Deep Purple Mark II show was the fantastic improvisation. They incorporated elements of uh, Baroque, classical elements, sometimes little folky lines, jazzy lines, and the interplay between Lord and Blackmore, of course, is now legendary. Older materials such as Mandrake Root and Ring That Neck, which had been stage favourites from the previous lineup, were taken apart, expanded, and reinvented by the new look Deep Purple Mark II. This ability to improvise live on stage would later become a key element of Made in Japan. On stage, you have a lot of intense excitement. It's like adrenaline, kind of. Uh nervous uh, presence. Right. People either love it or they, they get scared of it. You know? That's why we have a lot of people who maybe hate us because we're so, we're so demanding. The core of Purple in the Mark II lineup of Purple, Richie Blackmore on guitar, Ian Pace on drums, and you've got John Lord on keyboards. Those three fifths were, were, were you know, the, the, I guess the, the main guys that would go off on a tangent. They all got a turn, really. Um, you know, there'd be a drum solo, you, John Lord would be allowed to cut loose on the keyboards, Blackmore would get his turn. The others would support the people that were improvising properly. They weren't like reading a book, you know, free solo, I can't really be bothered. They were really playing for each other and feeding each other chords and rhythms and different ideas. And when, when one of the players went off to, you know, a place they'd never gone before, they went with them. Having seen them way back in uh, 6970, um, they were they were doing some very long pieces on stage. It was a period when people talked about bands being a little self-indulgent and solos going on for too long, that sort of thing, which Cream had done in the, in the mid-60s. But with Deep Purple, you always had a song. There was always a strong structure. So when there was improvising going on, when they did play full tilt for uh, long concerts, you know, maybe one number would go on for 15 or 20 minutes. So, uh, but there was always... Um, an arrangement to it. It wasn't just endless jamming. It was all about musicality. It was all about showing off who could do the, who could play the best. And Purple were the experts at doing this. So I think, you know, they take a three-minute pop song, spin it out into something else. I love to have that freedom, just going on stage and playing whatever I want to play at the time. I mean, I'll play the numbers which I'm supposed to play, but the in-between parts, if I'm feeling good, I'll be away and play something. Completely off the wall. I've never ever played in my life. Richie Blackmore, in particular, I think was was the leading improviser within Purple. Um, quite a volatile character, and I think it pleased him to to go off, you know, somewhere else, and hope that the other guys would follow. You know, he was kind of teasing them really, and um, almost encouraging them to make mistakes.
I'm sure there was some sort of initially friendly competition which later developed into animosity in, in some areas in the camp. Uh, but I'm sure there was, and I'm sure they spurred one another on to even greater heights. Blackmore was the one orchestrating everything. He's a little bit like a conductor um, rather than just a sort of guitar hero. You, you get these sort of very exaggerated sort of nods and these sort of frowns and flick of the wrist. All these little things, these little signals that he's aiming to the other band members, usually the drummer in pace, which is sort of say, pick up the tempo or drop it down now. You could see Blackmore pointing one, two, three, if it meant two measures or three measures to go. You'd see Blackmore doing and the audience would think, oh, he's been a bit flashy, but actually he was saying to the rest of the band, I'm just about to finish now, we're going back to the bridge, you know. Back of the head with the guitar for Ian Gillen, sing now, or, uh, you know, to John Lord, play. Hand signals or motifs, musical motifs, so a phrase would be repeated and repeated and repeated, a sequence of maybe eight times, and that would allow the rest of the band to think. If they didn't hear it first time, they certainly heard it two or three times, and OK, and then eye contact is the last.